Well, it is good to be back from sabbatical, um, and it's been funny. It's been a, even though it was five weeks in many ways, it felt like it's only been a week. Um, but in other ways, it seems like it's been forever since I've been with uh, you all. I told some folks that it was good to see that uh, my name tag on my office wasn't changed to someone else's name while I was gone. Uh, but it, it, uh, it has flown by, and it's kind of wild to think. Uh, so right before I started my sabbatical, um, our family was, we were watching the Winter Olympics. The Winter Olympics had just started up just before my sabbatical, which is crazy to think that it was only five weeks ago, because as you could tell, the summer, you know, weather, the warm weather has already kind of struck me. I was at a Brennan's soccer game yesterday and um, didn't bring any sunscreen. So, but that's, that's up with that. Uh, but at any rate, the Winter Olympics had just started up. It's crazy to think that it's only been five weeks since uh, those started up. And our family, I don't know if you guys are this way, we are big Olympic fans. Um, we love to watch the summer and the winter Olympics every time they come on. You know that someone's a big fan of the Olympics when they watch the opening ceremonies. Because let's just be honest, they're really weird, okay? And like I, I told somebody that, that I think I was impressed with this year's because they were the least weirdest Olympic opening ceremonies I've ever seen. That was the only compliment I could come up with for the opening ceremonies. But it's, it's kind of cool. But it's long and drawn out when you watch like the countries come in. In case you didn't know, they actually you, you come in out alphabetically based on the native language of the country who's hosting. So there's like, there's no way of knowing. In fact, I usually Google, where is the United States going to be? So I can know how long do I need to watch? You know, when are they going to be? Do I need to tune in? But we watch it all the time. And it's really cool because you can go on with technology now with smartphone or smart TVs and smart devices. You can kind of preset the certain um, the events that you want to record so that you don't miss those. You know, back in the day, it used to be that, that they would re-televise kind of the big sports and, or the big events. And that was all you got to see. But now you can see all of them. Our family even kind of got caught up in curling for a little bit. We had no idea what was going on. But man, it was cool to watch when they're out there sliding around and pushing the things out. I want to do that. I don't know what they're doing, but I want to try it out. But some of my favorite events are like the, the downhill skiing. When they, when they pop out of that gate and they are just screaming down that hill at like 80 miles an hour, and they're taking those turns and the snow is flying up and they're going over the jumps and stuff like that. Or I love the, the sliding um, sports, like uh, the bobsled. Man, when they get that, I don't know, we're, we love the old movie Cool Runnings. When they, they get all pumped up and they start pushing that big uh, sled down the, the starting gate and they all hop in and they go flying down there. Or even the snowboarding, you know, this year was big because Sean White, who's a big name in snowboarding, this was his final um, Olympic competing. Um, it was really cool to see all that when they just get so high and they do such big things. And in some ways, I really think, and I don't know if you're like a, a, a summer Olympics person over a winter Olympics person, or if you like one more than the other, but in some ways, it seems like the winter Olympics are far more extreme or dangerous than the, than the, uh, the summer Olympics. The winter Olympics, they seem like, you know, the things that you do are more life-threatening than the summer Olympics. I mean, summer Olympics, you know, you're running, you're swimming, you're throwing discus and shot putting all this stuff. But in the Winter Olympics, I mean, you are taking your life into your own hands and doing some of these things that is just crazy. And in many ways, it, I think that the Winter Olympics require a higher level of commitment than the Summer Olympics. Um, these, these guys here are doing the skeleton. This is called the skeleton bobsled, in case you didn't know. Um, these guys, I mean, they are on this tiny little sled and they run as fast as possible in the opening gate there. And then they just slide down there and they... Yeah, they kind of steer it a little bit with their body weight and stuff, but they're just praying, you know, that they don't go flying off the side or they don't fall off of their sled and they're going faster and faster and faster trying to get down this hill. And it's crazy the amount of commitment that I think that they have to have uh, for this. Because for them, when they, when they get started, it's not like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to kind of halfway do this, or I'm, you know, I may change my mind halfway through. No, when they, when they start on this, they are running full speed, and they've got to give it their all, and then they've got to dive onto this sled and let gravity kind of take over and pull them down, uh, pull them down the hill. And, and, it's, and the thing is, is that I, I think in life, there are different things that require more commitment than other things. I think there are certain things in life that sometimes we can kind of, you know, kind of go halfway in on it and just kind of do a little bit here or there. But then there are other things that require every bit of our commitment. And I think as Christ followers, God calls us, he wants from us 
a higher level of commitment than sometimes we're willing to put into it. Now, this morning, we're going to be in the book of Revelation. So if you want to grab your Bibles and start turning there, you can. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 2. We've, we'll have it up on the screen like we usually do, or you can get out your digital devices and follow along there. But the book of Revelation is a super popular book. Uh, there's lots of imagery. There's lots of uh, things in there that, that, uh, that there's lots of debate about. People debate about, you know, is this stuff that is to come? Is this stuff that has already happened? Is this stuff that is happening? And they, they debate about the, the different things that is representing the names and the people and all these different creatures and stuff that are in there. And I think what happens, though, is a lot of times when people get into the book of Revelation, they miss the first two chapters because it doesn't have all that crazy stuff in there in the first two chapters. And what's really in those first two chapters is actually some letters from Jesus. Jesus tells John, I want you to to write down these letters and I want you to send it to the seven to these seven churches. Now we don't know if he literally wanted these to go to specific actual churches or if these churches just kind of represented all churches in general. But we, we actually started studying these letters um, two years ago, um, around this time right now, right before the pandemic hit, and we had to pivot and go online with stuff. And we actually never got to finish out the study that we were doing on these different churches. But I encourage you to check it out sometime. There's seven different letters that Jesus sends to these different churches. And we're going to look at the very first one to the church in Ephesus. And we're going to pick up in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1. It says this, to the church in Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now don't be distracted. There's some imagery there. Don't miss what's coming next of what he's going to say to them. He says, I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not. I have found them and have, and have found them false. You have per persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Now, it's interesting. If we were to stop right there, and if we weren't to read any more of this letter from Jesus, we would kind of look at this and be like, oh, that, that sounds pretty good. That's a pretty good start. Sounds kind of encouraging. I mean, he says these things like, hey, listen, I know your deeds. I know what you, what you do. I know your work. He says, I know of your, your hard work. I know how you're working really hard on these different things. He says, I know of your perseverance. I know of the persecution coming on you, but how you're, you're standing strong about these things. He even talks about their, their high level of, of morality and their high standard of holiness that they're holding people to. And even how that he talks about how, you know, you're going through these hardships. And in the first century, when this was going on, um, the, the Roman empire was cracking down hard on Christians. And he says, I, I know of these things that, that you're going through and you've stood strong with them. And we can read these and we can think, man, this is really great. This church, they're, they're being encouraged and they're being praised by Jesus. And in fact, when, when I was studying this, the, my natural reaction was that. I was making notes and I was like, man, that's so great. You know, they're doing these good things. Jesus is praising them for this. But, but this is why, this is why it's important that whenever we read scripture, we shouldn't just grab a little passage here or a little verse there, but we need to read it as it was written in chunks and in sections as it was intended. Because when we read just a, a verse here or a passage there, we may miss the bigger picture of what's really going on. And like I said, you know, we could, we could look at this and we could, we could see this. We could feel like, you know, maybe Jesus is saying some good things, but I want to give you some insights that what may seem like some praise from Jesus is about to switch very quickly and not really be his encouragements to them at all. Because while these things that Jesus is listing off, their hard work, their perseverance, their high level of morality and holiness, those things are good and they're important. But the problem was that those things alone were their focus. And these were the things that they were committed to. And I really believe that what Jesus was trying to help them see is that they were committed to the wrong things. Now you may hear that and say, well, they were committed to the wrong things. How, how, is, how are these things the wrong things? How could, how could those things be the wrong things for them to be committed, about and, uh, could be committed to? I think as Christians, sometimes we can get committed to a lot of things that on the surface, they seem like, well, this is what we should be all about. Well, this is what we should be committed to. This is the things that we should be running after. There's a lot of things even today that Christians struggle with about what their commitment is going to be given to. And for one thing, I think some Christians can be very committed to things like tradition. 
For, you know, the Christian life, the Christian history has a long history going all the way back to the first century with, with the very first Christians of following Christ. It even goes further than, th- than that back into the Jewish and the, the Hebrew roots, even all the way back to the very beginning of time. So there's a lot there and there's a lot of tradition that can be kind of built upon. And there's a lot of good things within those traditions. And, and, and even maybe for you, there's kind of maybe some traditions within your own personal faith heritage. You know, maybe there's some things that you did growing up in the church as a kid with your family that, that have become a very important part of your life and your identity. Or, or maybe for you, if you're, if you're kind of newer to church and newer to faith and stuff like that, maybe there's some new traditions that you've kind of developed and you've kind of gotten involved with. And all those things are, are, are important, but I think sometimes we can get so focused on our traditions that we kind of neglect everything else except the things that we have our traditions. And even when we stop and we think about the traditions, and we're kind of like, well, why do we do these things? Why do we do these traditions? And we can't even explain to people why we have some of these traditions. It makes me think of a, of a young lady who was preparing her very first Easter uh, lunch for her family after be, being uh, newly married. And she's there at her house and her mom is helping her out and they're going to get the ham ready and they go and they get out the, the, uh, the, uh, the roasting pan. They're going to put the ham in there to get it all into the oven to get it ready for the, for the dinner. And, she, and her mom goes over and she cuts off the end of the ham. And her daughter says, you know, mom, why, why do you always cut off the end of the ham there? You know, what, what's the purpose of that? And she said, well, you know, I, I really don't know why I do that, but you know, your grandmother always did that, and that's kind of where I learned it from, of cutting off the end of the ham. And so they said, why don't we call her and find out, you know, like, what's the deal with this? And so they call up grandma, and they ask her, say, hey, grandma, you know, we're putting together Easter dinner right now. We're getting ready to put the ham in the oven. We got the roasting pan out. We've cut off the end of the ham. Why did you always do that? And they're thinking, maybe there's some kind of, like, thing of, like, well, when you cut off the end of the ham, it, you know, it allows it to sear in all the flavor on both ends, and it just keeps it, and it's so wonderful. Or, or maybe it's a symbolic thing of, like, you know, you cut off a little bit to represent a sacrifice for what God has done for us, but it was nothing at all like that. Grandma simply said, well, my casserole dish was too small for the, fa- for the ham to fit in, so I had to cut off the end. <laughs> And sometimes we can do that in life where we're like, we have these things. It's like, man, this is so important that I do this. And I've always done this. And it's always been this way. And when we stop and think about it, we're like, but I have no clue why. And I have no idea why I do these things and why these things are so important. And as Christians and even as a church, we can sometimes get so wrapped up in tradition and we can miss the things that maybe are more important. I think not only that, sometimes we can, we can get wrapped up as Christians in fear, and we can focus on fear. And when I say fear, I mean for many Christians, they kind of live in fear. They live in fear of what God might do to me. You know, when he, when he sees who I am, I don't know what he's going to do to me. Or what if, I, what if I get things wrong? What if I make the wrong decision? You know, I, I have this big decision to make in life. And what if I, what if I do this wrong and I, and I don't do what God wants me to do? What is God going to do to me? Or they think about, you know, what, is, what if I'm not good enough for God? You know, what if my life isn't good enough? What if I'm not living the right way and living good enough and doing enough good things? And this, this fear can be so strong and so motivating for some Christians that it begins to be the motivation that they try and use for other people for bringing them into the faith. And sometimes they try to sort of scare people into heaven with the fear that they live with and that they've been so wrapped up with. And the fear is not what we should be focused on either. But I think even still for some Christians, there can be this sense of entitlement that they get focused on, a sense of entitlement. And when I say that, what I mean is that there are some Christians that, that always want to feel like, well, I'm on the winning team. I'm a part of the winning group, and I'm right, and well, that means then that everyone else is wrong, and my church is the right church, and my group is the right group, and well, then that means, again, that all the other ones are wrong. And we can look at other people who maybe don't believe everything that we believe quite the same way that we believe things, and we, we think that, well, then they're just wrong, because I've got it all right. I've got to figure it out, and they're wrong, and even sometimes we look at them as the enemy, and we can see ourselves in this sort of a holier-than-thou way of thinking of ourselves in that way. And, 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 and sure, you know, we, we wouldn't say it in that way. We may never articulate those, those specific words of, I'm right and everyone else is wrong, but maybe that's how we treat people who don't go to our church or who have different lifestyles or different practices than us. We just see them as dirty sinners. And this sense of entitlement, this feeling of 
You know, I deserve God's goodness because I'm faithful to what he's called me to. And I'm doing, you know, I'm working hard on what God has told me is right. And I'm doing all the right things. But, and it can motivate us to kind of go deeper and deeper into this, this arrogance and these haughty ways. And what Jesus was telling this church, and I believe in many ways he tells us the same thing, is he's saying, look, I, I see what you're doing. But I also see why you're doing these things. I see your motivation. And while we may be doing a lot of things and working really hard and persevering in those things, we can maybe have the wrong reasons and the wrong motivation and the wrong commitment. Because he even says in verse 4, Jesus says, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Some translations even say, You have forsaken your first love. And what this means is what Jesus is trying to say to them is that, look, you, you've missed the whole reason you were drawn to Jesus. You've missed the things that are most important. And what he's saying to them and to us is that, th that they had misplaced their commitment. They had put their commitment and their devotion into so many different things and they had missed where God really wanted them to have their commitment. They were invested in these different things. They were, they were missing, though, what mattered most. And this can be easy to do. And it's not something that ever happens overnight. Like no one, no one wakes up and says, you know what? I'm going to forget about what God really wants from me, and I'm just going to focus on all the wrong things. No, it's a little by little, small creep along the way as we go, that things change over time. And it happens not only in these first century churches, but it happens in Christian lives and in churches today as well. Instead of a church, the mission of the church being to take the good news of Jesus to others, we instead find ways to make sure that everyone knows that we don't agree with them and what we're against. Instead of going to other people and serving them, we, act, we, we expect other people to come to us and act and be like us. Instead of seeing people as people, who have shortcomings and temptations and sins, just like we all do. We expect everyone to, to be like us and to act like us. And instead of actively taking part in helping God's kingdom expand and grow, we sit back and we let someone else do it because that just seems to be their thing. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let them do it. And we can so quickly get wrapped up in things and we can forget really what matters most. Now, I opened uh, earlier by talking about the people who do that skeleton bobsled race. And, and, and it would be like, for them, if they had the same kind of commitment to the wrong things, it would be like if they showed up every day and took all kinds of time to carefully uh, sharpen the, the runners on their sleds or maybe to, to wax the, the, the carriage and make sure it's nice and shiny and looks great, but they never once put it on the ice and slide down the track. Or if they, if they went and they bought all the gear, they bought the best helmet, the most aerodynamic sled, the tightest suit. I mean, they wear some tight stuff, man. I could never do it, trust me. Uh, but it, they, they buy all the right stuff, but they never once take all that equipment and they go into the starting blocks and actually do it. Or even if they had gone and joined a team or gone to a training center and learned about all the right techniques and learned about all the right things to do and where to go and all the ways to talk about the sport and everything, but never once participated participated in a race. We would look at them and say, they're missing it, man. Why are they even doing that stuff? They've missed the whole point. And we would ask them, why are you spending so much time and so much effort, but never actually doing the right things? Instead, these guys, they commit themselves. When they get in those starting blocks, they run as fast as they possibly can. And they jump on that sled and they go head first down that hill just holding on for dear life, steering a little bit, and allowing gravity to do what, it do, do what it does. And friends, that could be us. We could, we could miss the whole point of what Jesus has called us to, or we could trust in him, and we could commit ourselves and getting those starting blocks and run as fast as possible. Because Jesus says this in verse 5 then after that. He says, consider how far you have fallen. Repent, and do the things you did at first. And so Jesus, he, he kind of paints this picture for the church of, of how they are focusing on all the wrong things and how they're missing out on these different things and, and how they've forgotten what's most important and, and you've forgotten your first love. You need to get back to those things. But then he gives them good news after kind of scolding them. And he says, look, there's still time to make things right. 
He says it's not a death sentence or even him coming to punish them. I mean, Jesus goes on to say that if they don't repent, that if they don't change their ways, if they don't focus on the right things, he says that he'll come and remove their lampstand. And, and that's just a figurative way. It's a, it's a word picture of him coming and taking his presence from them. And that's a scary thing to think of God taking his presence, his spirit from them. You, you think about, it makes me think of Samson. Samson was, a, was one of the judges of the Old Testament. Samson was a, a man that as a, as a baby, he was dedicated to God in a special way. And one of the things that his parents committed him to was that he would never cut his hair. I don't know what kind of conversations mom would have with the son about that, you know, because moms fuss at their kids about having long hair, right? You need a haircut. Well, mom couldn't fuss at Samson about this. Well, one day as Samson's an adult, you probably know the story that he is finally convinced to give up the secret and, and, the, and why he has such great strength. The Philistines come in and they cut his hair, and the Bible says, and he didn't even know that God's spirit had left him. Or, or we go to King David, the king of the Israelites, king of God's people. The moment that, that King David, or King Saul, I'm sorry, it's the moment that King Saul made it all about himself, made it about doing things his way and leading in his way, God's spirit left King Saul. Even after that, King David, when he was on the throne and he commits the sin of adultery and then commits the sin of having this woman's husband murdered, he, he realizes his sin. Nathan comes and confronts him and he's, he's, he's brought to such great, great guilt and shame and he prays, God, don't take your spirit from me. I mean, that's a scary thought that we could get to a point that we could be so focused on such the wrong things that God could come and say, I'm going to have to take my spirit, my presence from your life. And I believe it still happens today with Christians and even individuals, but even with God's church at times, that we can be so wrapped up in things that look good on the surface. And maybe we would look at it and say, yeah, we're doing all the right things, but we've forgotten our first love. We forget what matters most. Now, look, I'm not standing up here today saying that SEC is like off the rails and that terrible things are happening. And I believe that God's taken his. Now, I'm not saying that at all. You know, I don't want you guys to think we're never sending him on sabbatical again because he has lost it. He's come back and he's crazy. But what I am saying today is that we as God's church, as Smithfield Christian Church, we need to commit to what matters most. We need to commit ourselves as individuals within this church, but we also need to commit ourselves as a body, as a collective family, to be about our first love, the things that drew us to God at first, the things that matter most. In fact, today, um, I want to take some time to personally recommit to a few things. You know, oftentimes, uh, sometimes after a sermon, someone will come to me and say, well, I don't know if you were preaching that sermon for me today, Joe, or I don't know if you had it yet, me in your mind when you were writing that sermon. And so often I got to tell you, no, I didn't have you in mind. But today, this sermon is mostly for me. This sermon is mostly for me as an opportunity to take some time this morning and to stand here before you and recommit myself as your pastor in certain ways. And so I want to do that, and in a little bit, I'm going to encourage you to recommit yourself, but personally, I want to take some time coming off this sabbatical, coming back into this time of being a part of this church body again and leading in this way, I want to recommit to a few ways. And because I'm a preacher, I got three of them, and they all start with the same letter, okay? The first one is I'm recommitting myself to prayer. I am recommitting myself to prayer because, look, I'm going to tell you this right now. I'm going to confess this to you. I stink at praying. I don't mean I don't know how to pray. I don't mean I don't like trust in God and his power. I don't mean that like I'm embarrassed to pray in front of people or to be around people when I pray. I don't mean any of that. But what I mean is so often in, in my personal life, in my family life, in, in working amongst the church, so often my first reaction to things is, well, what am I going to do about it? Well, how am I going to fix this? Or what's my plan for this? Instead of saying, hang on. I need to stop and I need to pray and I need to seek God and what he wants for me, for my family, for his church. It was interesting over the sabbatical, I, I read several things and I was listening to many things and I, I don't know where it was or who said it, but one person said, you know, too often we think we have to pray for our ministry when really prayer is our ministry. 
And friends, I come here today to say to you that I am recommitting myself that prayer is going to be my ministry and our ministry. We're going to be praying for God to be active and God to be moving and through his spirit amongst us as his people, for us to be loving this community, for us to be making a difference in each other's lives and in the lives around us. I come today and I recommit myself to prayer. The second thing I want to recommit myself to today is people. I want to recommit myself to people. You know, um, this, this past year, the past two years, man, they have been a difficult two years. And it's crazy to think that it's two years ago that uh, the world got flipped upside down. And things closed down, things transitioned online. Uh, we, we developed new practices like social distancing and had, uh, we had things like masks and we talked about different, I mean, all kinds of different stuff and vaccines and so many different things. It has been a crazy and tough two years. And within the church, it's not been any easier, you know, within working and leading within the church. I can still remember two years ago, Gabrielle and I sitting in, actually, no, we were over Zoom. We were talking over Zoom together about what we were going to do and how, you know, Easter's in a few weeks, and this is probably all going to be over by then, and we'll be able to be back together for Easter service. And well, I mean, you know how that went. It didn't happen that way. And we were online for Easter, and we did all these different things to try and stay connected during that time. We did um, a Bible study over Zoom, uh, we, we, uh, we were checking in with people regularly with phone calls. Uh, my family, we drove around and we delivered cookies to everybody in our church. Y'all live too far apart from each other, okay? It took us three days to do this. It was crazy, man. But we did these things. We did all these, we, we did these programs. We did these uh, events. We did these things to try and, and, try and get a, a handle on all this stuff. And that was good. And that was important at, the right t- at, at that time. But what happened was more and more, we kind of continued to focus on stuff. And we focused on programs. And we focused on events and initiatives and all this stuff. And along the way, we began to realize, hey, this is not all about programs. This is not all about even a Sunday morning worship service. This is about people. This is about people within our congregation. This is about people that are driving by that have never stepped foot into this building before. This is about people who need the love of Christ. And so today I am recommitting myself not to, not to programs, not to events. We're going to still do those things. But my, my hope and my focus for our church is to be about people and how we can love people how we can walk alongside people, how we can love all kinds of people and help them find Christ. Well, the third thing that I'm recommitting to today um, is purpose. Purpose. You know, I mentioned earlier how I have this tendency to focus on my plans, right? You know, I, 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 I'm a fixer. When things break at my house, you know, the logical thing is like, let's go buy a new this or that. And I'm like, no, I can fix it. I got YouTube, right? I can go on there and I can find out how to fix anything. And I did that with a dryer once and I fixed it twice. And then the third time I burned out the motor because I wired it backwards. And I was like, okay, we'll buy a new dryer. Um, and sometimes, you know, I, I can get to a point where I'm so focused on, um, on, on all these different things that I think are right and all these different things. And we can begin to veer off on things that look good and we can veer off on things that seem like, well, that might be a good idea. And we begin to forget about the purpose that God has called us to originally, kind of like our first love. And I, and I love the fact that last year in January, we shared within our church family that our new mission statement, our new, what we're going to be about is to love like Jesus. And it can be very easy for us to forget about that and to get going, doing a whole lot of different things and forget about, okay, well, does this help us love like Jesus? Will this help us love our community like Jesus? Will this help us love each other like Jesus? Will this help us grow as we love Jesus? And my hope and my plan is for us to be recommitted to this purpose of loving like Jesus, to do these things, but to do them in a way that helps us to be devoted to that. That's my recommitment today to you all, to God, to be devoted to prayer, to people, and to purpose. But what about you? Sure, this is an opportunity for me to get up here and kind of declare these things and share with you what I hope and what I'm praying that God would use me to do in these, in these months and years and whatever ahead. But what about you? I, I want to challenge you as I kind of begin to wrap this up. I want you to think, and, and there's kind of four things I want to throw out at you as maybe possible ways that you could really pray through and think, okay, God, what about me? Do, do I need to recommit in any certain way? Because it's not good enough just to hear someone else talk about it. We need to take that time too and say, okay, well, God, are you saying something to me? Is there something that I need to do as well? Well, I want to toss out to you maybe the first way you could consider recommitting is through your discipleship. 
Discipleship, that's a, that's a churchy word that basically means following Jesus more, growing in our walk, growing in our faith with Jesus. And maybe you know a lot about God. Maybe you know a lot about the Bible. But the question that is more important is, do you know God personally? You know, maybe you're good at going to church and going to church things and listening to sermons and maybe even listen to Christian radio and stuff like that. But your relationship with God, is it anything more than just a box you might check on a survey or a census or a thing that you do an hour a week? Instead, I want to challenge you to take your, your walk with Christ seriously. And I really believe that there, there are a lot of ways we can grow in our faith and our relationship with God, but I think there are kind of two fundamental ways that we can start with, and that is reading God's Word and praying. Maybe those two things can be your focus for this next week or this next month to say, look, every day I'm going to find a way that I can stop and I can pray, and I can stop and I can read some scripture and take some time. And friends, if you need help with that, if you need some tools with that, you come find me afterward because we are without excuse. We have so many tools in today's age to be able to do these things. Perhaps your recommitment is, this, is in discipleship. Or perhaps your recommitment needs to be in evangelism. That's another churchy word that we use only within the church, but it basically means telling others about Jesus. You know, just, I think sometimes we can get kind of intimidated about that. I think we can get kind of scared when we think of this idea of telling other people about my faith or about the things I believe in. You know, Jesus, the very last things he tells his followers before he leaves this earth is to go and make disciples. He says, go and you're going to be my witnesses. And I love that word witnesses because I think it takes some of the, the scariness away, the, some of the shock away from evangelism. Because you know what a witness does? A witness just tells what they have seen and experienced personally. It's not about the witness knows everything. You know, if you witness a car accident, you don't have to know how a car works and how to fix the cars. You can just say, look, all I know is I saw this and I experienced this. And when it comes to our relationship with God, and when we want to share that relationship and we want to be a witness to others, all we have to do is be able to say, look, I don't know how it all works, but this is what I've experienced, and this is what he's done in my life. And so maybe your recommitment needs to be in the area of evangelism and taking that great news to other people. Maybe it's in the area of service. Maybe you're the type of person that you kind of, you, you feel like, man, I need to be doing more, but I don't know what to do. You know, I love how in the Bible, the scriptures describes the church so often like a body. And, and, and when, when we think about how our bodies are supposed to work and how things work together, I mean, even right now, I, you know, I'm a hand preacher, I'm a hand talker. I don't have to think, you know, arms swing. I don't have to think mouth open. I don't have to think lungs breathe. You know, God just made our bodies in such a way that we work together in that way. But sometimes God's church doesn't function that way. And sometimes there are parts of God's church that are kind of not pulling their weight and not doing their thing that God made them to do. And maybe you need to take some time and recommit yourself to serving and using the talents that God has given you. In, in fact, we've been doing something lately where um, if, if, there are, if you want to get involved in service, sometimes it's like, well, I forget to talk to Joe. I forget to go up to him and say something to him. You know, if you want to be involved in helping and serving and ministering some way, then get your phones out right now and text this number. Um, send us a text and, and just say, you know, put your name in there. If there's a way that you want to serve or if you're like, I have no idea, then we'll help find a way. We'll help find a way that fits your, your gifting and your talents and, your, and the things that we have going on here. But maybe you need to recommit to serve and to be an active part of the body. Or the last way I want to suggest to you is possibly to consider recommitting to generosity. And generosity comes in so many ways. You know, maybe you're very stingy with your love to people. Maybe you're a type of person that you keep it for only certain people in your life and you don't share that love with others. Maybe the type of person that, that you're, you're kind of scared about trusting God with your finances. And you're like, look, God, I don't know about this because if I, if I, if I take this step and if I do this and I give in this way, w will I have enough for these things that go on? And I think sometimes if we look at ourselves, we think, well, yeah, I love people. Well, yeah, I, I give. Well, yeah, I'm generous with things. But the thing is, is that I think we know that we've stepped into generosity when it causes us to pause. 
When we can just very easily do it and it's no big deal, we can give things away in our life and it's not that big of a deal, I don't know if we can call that generosity. Instead, generosity is that time when we're about to do that. We're about to step out on faith in that way and it causes us to kind of stop and say, okay, I guess I'm going to trust God on this one. That's generosity. And maybe you're in, in your life, that's what you need to do. You need to recommit yourself to generosity. Folks, in Philippians 3.10, Paul writes this. And I love these things that Paul writes. And he says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and the participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Friends, none of us are perfect. Even the Apostle Paul is saying here, look, I'm not there yet. I still got so much more to go. None of us have arrived there, but all of us can take another step. And so often we need to take the time to sort of redraw the line in the sand and say, okay, today I'm recommitting myself. I'm serious about it. I'm stepping over this line and I'm all in. To be like those, those, those skeleton bobsledders who grab a hold of that, that sled and they start sprinting as fast as possible and they jump on and they hold on. Friends, maybe today you need to run as fast as possible with God and grab a hold of him and just jump on and hold on for the ride. I don't know what it is for you, but in just a moment, Sid and Sarah are going to come back up here and they're going to lead, lead us in the song that we sang before communion. And I want to encourage you, during that song, while we're singing that, maybe take some time and be praying, God, are you, are you calling me to recommitment somewhere in my life? Maybe you're here today and you've never committed yourself to Christ. Maybe you've never taken that step of faith, of placing your faith in Jesus to save you, to forgive you, to make you brand new. Maybe you've never taken that step uh, to, uh, of baptism, to have that fresh start, to participate in the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Whatever it might be, if you need to make a, 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 a personal commitment, a recommitment, a public recommitment, then I want you to come find me in the back. In fact, I'm going to invite Bob, one of our elders, and Beth will be in the back there. If you want to pray with us, if you need someone to put an arm around you and say, let's figure out the next step together, you come find us in the back. Or if you need to recommit to something, come find us back there. But whatever it is, friends, I encourage you today to take the time to recommit yourself to God and moving forward to the things that matter most. Let's pray together. God, I'm so grateful that you, you are a God that you give us so many chances because so often, Lord, we, we head off in a direction that we're never, we were never intended to be heading bef- originally. And we get, we get wrap up, wrapped up in things, and sometimes they can seem like good things, Lord, but sometimes we can get so distracted of what, from what you've been calling us to. God, I pray that today you would call us back to what you have originally called us to, our first love. God, help us, help us to be a people that are focused on you, and what you want for us, and what you want from us. Not about the things around us, not about the people around us, not even about uh, some of the things that we've done for so long, but only about you. And God, I pray for those people right now. Maybe there's some people right here in this room that are struggling with that. Maybe there is something in their heart that they feel like, man, I need to take this step of recommitment. I, I need to take this step of commitment for the first time. God, give them the courage, give them the push, the shove, whatever it might need to be to step over that line. And to say, today is the day that I'm committing myself back to God and I'm following him. Whatever it is, Lord, help us to do that. Give us the courage through your spirit to do that. Help us to trust in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand back up.